Hello friends, I'm back here with Mark Raycott, but instead of talking about Batmobiles, this time we're going to be talking about his film production company, Magic House Productions. But before we begin, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Alright Mark, during our last interview we talked about Fiberglass Freaks, your 1966 Batmobile replica business, and in addition to that, you also own a film production company and have made full-length motion pictures. Where did your passion from, for filmmaking come from? My passion for filmmaking began actually uh, when I was about six years old, I saw the Star Trek television series, the original series with William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly way, way back in the early 70s. I caught it in reruns. I didn't see it in the first first run of the show. And I really dug up on the, the special effects of the TV show. I was um, really just an armchair fan, though, at the time. But it was in uh, 1977 when Star Wars came out that I really became addicted to the thought of, of making movies. Uh, my thought was uh, that as I watched uh, this movie unfold with the giant Star Destroyer overhead, I said, if movies can make a person feel this good, I really want to do that. So I started studying filmmaking in earnest at that point. So I'd already checked out the making of Star Trek, and uh, that was the first book I ever purchased for myself, by the way, was the making of Star Trek. And uh, three different books on the making of the movie Jaws. So I was already well on my way, but by the time Star Wars came out, I was really, really moving towards that direction. So at the age of 12, I'd made the decision that I wanted to make movies when I became an adult. All right, so tell us about the films that you've made. I started making movies at the age of 14 years old. I was a freshman in high school. I made a Batman fan film as my very first movie as a 60 minute feature, short feature, but a feature. And this was what uh, really taught us about filmmaking. We learned about lighting and about audio, made every mistake in the book. Once again, uh, learning the craft. And then I made the Phantom and my uh, sophomore year, which was a second Batman fan film and much more professional. Things were starting to really gel. And then by the time I got to my third movie, The Eyes of the Cat, and that particular movie I shot uh, while I was majoring in filmmaking at Ball State University. And this was the one that really started to launch things. So I it won one of the David Letterman Scholarship Awards at Ball State University. It was the second year that those awards were offered. And it was nice to be able to get that uh, accolade from the, the David Letterman Scholarship Committee. And nice to get a, a telegram from David Letterman himself. So that was pretty cool. Awesome. So what other films has Magic House worked on? Well, after those fan films were done, we started making movies professionally. I worked on a movie called Terror Squad, an absolutely terrible movie, but a great experience in Kokomo, Indiana. And I did that as an internship and I learned the craft. I learned about product placement on the business side and learned about uh, about film production schedules and things of that nature in the office. And then on the set, uh, learned about set construction, learned about stunts and, uh, and those sides of things. And it was really, really neat. Uh, special effects makeup too was really uh, an interest of mine. Then I made my own movies after that. So I did a Rock and Roll Starship, our science fiction comedy. If you can imagine the Ghostbusters in a Star Wars movie, that's the way it works. Hundreds of references to TV shows and movies. Then I made Starship 2, the sequel, and we upped the ante quite a bit for that particular one. Then I worked on a whole bunch of feature films for other filmmakers, other producers and directors. And the most famous one of those was Star Trek vs. Batman, which was a fan film produced by Chris Allen out of Indianapolis. And this movie won all kinds of crazy awards 
and has been seen by thousands and thousands of people on YouTube and uh, it was a huge hit at science fiction conventions and comic book conventions. But the most fun one was probably A Time for the Heart because it was selected for the San Diego, uh, San Diego Comic Con Film Festival. And we got to go to the San Diego Comic Con for the very first time, not as fans, but as guests. So that was really cool. Awesome. So if somebody wants to see Rock and Roll Starship, where do they find a copy? Well, at our website, fiberglassfreaks.com, under the store, there's one for movies, and Rock and Roll Starship is available there. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Sure. So, besides full-length motion pictures, what else does Magic House do? Magic House is a full-range production company, from the modest to the magnificent, so we can do anything from a little itty bitty project like a commercial or uh, a wedding, uh, those kinds of things, all the way up to a full-fledged production with over 200 people in the crew and anywhere in between. So we've done lots of commercials, lots of weddings. We've done lots of documentaries. We, um, we shot 17 hour and a half documentaries for the Gen Con gaming convention. And this was a huge, huge project for us. It took almost a year to edit all of those videos. And that was a ton of fun. We've done uh, some industrial, some talking head type videos uh, for Trinity Natural Health. We did lots of those uh, videos for the, their classes. Then, then they sold those online and on DVDs. So those were really, really neat and interesting to do and uh, just film transfers. We do all kinds of work. Awesome, thanks. Speaking of films, what are some films that have had a significant impact on you personally? Well, I, people ask me all the time about my top 10 movies and it's more like a top 50 because uh, there are a whole bunch of movies that have absolutely totally influenced me. Naturally, Star Wars in 1977, but uh, Indiana Jones in the the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark was a huge movie for me. Ghostbusters and, uh, was was also a lot of fun. Back to the Future, these are the movies that I could watch over and over again. Uh, comedies, Johnny Dangerously, uh, is is a blast and just thoroughly uh, I'm entertained by that one as well. And then uh, a surprise one is 1776. I really enjoy the cinematography, even though the movie was made in 72. Uh, it was really an influential movie for me as, as well. But there have been so many. Uh, it's hard to pin down just a handful. I hear that. All right, so if you could remake any film and do it the way you wanted to do it, which film would it be and why? Oh, there'll be some uh, some George Lucas fans that would probably not like me very much right now, but I really thought the prequels should have focused on a different part of that Star Wars universe. I wanted to see the movie that was in between Episode 1 and 2 and in between Episode 2 and 3, The Clone Wars. I know they made a cartoon, and I totally get that, but this was what I wanted to see. In 1977, when Obi-Wan Kenobi talks about what it was like before the Dark Times, before the Empire, I wanted to see what it was like to see the Jedi in their prime. And in a manner of speaking, the Mandalorian TV show has kind of answered some of that with, uh, with being able to see some of the characters in their prime. Uh, so that's been really cool to see. Awesome. So if you had any advice for any young folks that want to go into filmmaking and film production, what would your advice be? My advice to anybody that's wanting to get into filmmaking is to really work hard at shooting. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Make your videos. Get them out there. Get them done. Finish them and then get them distributed in any way, shape, or form. At no point in history have you had greater distribution opportunities than right now. The bad news is there's also more competition than has ever existed. 
but the good news is the avenues of distribution have never been easier and better. But get it out there. Uh, you can spend a lot of money on a film school, but my advice to you is to spend that money in production instead. Shoot your movies and get them done. Back in the day when I first got into movie making, it was all on film. So it was a, a really stark contrast to today's technology where you can shoot things digitally, even on your cell phones, like what we're doing right now. But back in the day when I was shooting film, whether it was Super 8, whether it was 16, or whether it was 35, we had to do everything on film, and it was so expensive to buy the film, to have the film developed, then you had to have a work print and you're editing the work print. Then you go to match the negative to the work print to be able to make everything uh, complete exactly as you want. Then you send it off to the lab and have the changes made to it. Well, now you can do everything into computer. You shoot the video and put it into your computer and you can uh, do all kinds of image manipulation in your editing software. And it's just fantastic. So, again, there's been no greater time to get into movie making than right now. And uh, my hat's off to you if you want to do this. It is a lot of hard work. It is a, but it's a good work. It is a lot of fun to do, too. And following your passion is always a great thing. Don't get stuck thinking that you have to own every single piece of filmmaking equipment, either once you start branching out and uh, start getting a crew, you'll find that they have their own equipment. And this was one of the pitfalls that a lot of filmmakers fall into, is that they think they have to have uh, the latest and greatest camera equipment, they have to have the latest and greatest lighting, and the latest and greatest in sound equipment. Well, once you start working with professionals that are in this business, you'll find that they will come with their own equipment. So that would help out tremendously to not break the budget doing those kinds of things, especially if that's not your forte, if that's not the area of expertise and not where you're headed, you don't want to buy that stuff anyway. If you're here in Indiana, you might want to consider joining the Indiana Filmmakers Network. They meet, uh, I think there are five different chapters here in Indiana, and it's really helpful to be able to meet with other filmmakers and uh, if you scratch each other's backs, you will find that the doors open for you pretty wide because people really want to see you succeed at just as you want to see them succeed. So consider that. I hear you even shot some film for Warner Brothers. <laughs> we sure did, Tim. It was a blast to be involved with one of the documentaries that was included with the Batman television series when it was finally released in November of 2014. And if you look at Holy Memorabilia, you might recognize a face because they did include me in that particular documentary. But we got to shoot footage of Kevin Silva's collection, which was at the time the world's largest collection, the Guinness Record collection of Batman memorabilia in the world. And we shot some of that footage, as well as some of the shots that ended up going into the documentary about the Batmobile business, Fiberglass Freaks. So, what a coup. So, Mark, what was it like on the set of Rock and Roll Starship? The set of Rock and Roll Starship was a whole bunch of crazy teenagers and 20-year-olds working all hours of the day for two weeks straight to create this fantastic fun movie and uh, against all the odds we we made it work the first day of shooting was march 4th of 1991 and it was 60 degrees short sleeve weather the second day of shooting was the biggest ice storm that shut down north central indiana i'd never seen anything like it before or since and three feet of ice and snow was between my dad's house, which we were using as a dormitory, and then my dad's garage, the two-story stone building out back that we were using for our sets. And that was a huge challenge. Keeping the cast and crew warm enough using kerosene heaters uh, was tough. We built our lights out of foam core and hung them with twine from the rafters. If that tells you, you know, not, uh, when you talk about stone knives and bearskin rugs, we were right there doing that. Exactly. So 
It was a huge challenge every single step of the way, but we were having crazy fun too. Working 16 to sometimes 20 hour days, uh, it was a blast. Tell me about set construction. Set construction is always neat for movies because you're building a, an illusion of what's actually there because there is no wall that's behind the camera. You're always building the area that's going to be seen only by the camera. And uh, as we built the sets for Starship 2, we had removable portions of the sets, just like you would, uh, it's called a wild wall. And we did a, a lot of that kind of work, like for the Zeppelin spacecraft bridge set to be able to shoot through certain panels and certain sections of it. And it really made a big difference for us. Greg Favre did a terrific job rebuilding the Zeppelin bridge set between Starship 1 and Starship 2. And that was a, that was a huge boost to the production value of the show. We built a lot of sets in uh, different, different places, uh, like Jim Knight's uh, warehouse, where he now has his uh, attorney's offices. We built the entire Ramsey's colony for Starship Two in that location. Okay, Mark, it's movie terms time. Uh-oh. What's a gaffer? A gaffer is somebody that operates and arranges the lighting for a movie. What about a grip? A grip is somebody that gets the gaffer's equipment and delivers it to the gaffer or to the director of photography. How about a best boy? A best boy is somebody that works usually in electrical, but not always, and is the second in command under the gaffer. How come there's not a best girl? Uh, that is a great question. <laughs> What's the difference between a grip and a dolly grip? A grip is somebody that moves equipment around. A dolly grip is somebody that moves the camera on a, a contraption on dolly track to be able to, to move, not zoom in and zoom out, but move the camera forward or backward or tracking alongside a particular person or a group of people. Narrow down the term producer. A producer can be various different people, but usually a producer is the person that hires the director and hires the main cast and secures the script and the funding. But it all depends. A, a producer might be somebody that's just looking for an extra credit. So like an actor might be wanting to add a producer credit so that they might be able to produce their own movies someday. Uh, and sometimes it might be a favor to somebody like uh, somebody that, that just installed carpeting inside of the producer or an, an executive's uh, apartment or in their house. You never know. What's the difference between the producer and the executive producer? An executive producer is typically somebody that has a lot of creative control. So that would be like George Lucas, who was working on the Star Wars movies back when he was just producing them, like Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. He wasn't producing them and he wasn't directing them. But as the executive producer, he was in charge of them creatively. What is VFX? VFX is visual effects. So unlike the practical effects that would happen on the set, so that would be squibs for gunshots and, and uh, fire and smoke and those kinds of things that are on the set, visual effects are everything that would happen in post-production to be able to augment the movie and make it better then. Sort of like CGI? CGI would be one way that is done. And computer-generated images is what CGI stands for. So that is a, a whole art in and of itself and has really revolutionized. Even dramatic movies are using CGI for set extensions to be able to do the upper part of a set without having to build it. Mark, isn't it true that craft services is the most important part of any film? <laughs> An army travels on its stomach and uh, a movie is no different. So there is a real reason why craft services are important. 